technical expertise, but don't actually um, practice in, and that is disability law and special education law. I am a business lawyer. My clients are business clients. And so I hope that I can share some useful things, but it's not legal advice. So that's, you know, just want to get that disclaimer out of the way. We'll take um, it. <laughs> the, um, the, I guess what I would like to do um, is, and my, um, how I think of this topic is basically covering the rules and process for determining when a student is found or can be found eligible for special education under the eligibility category of specific learning disability. And there is a pending rule administrative rule, which means that if it goes through and it's finalized, it will have the force of law. So the pending SLD for specific learning disability rule is a revision to the SLD rule that was enacted uh, a little over 10 years ago. And so what I've done is to take uh, take some time in comparing the draft revisions to the existing rule. And I want to talk about those revisions because there is there is five days we've got left before public comment closes on the draft rule. So I want to talk about the changes that were made, but I also want to talk about things that are, I think, of concern to many people who want students with reading difficulty served better in the existing rule and which have not changed. <laughs> so I thought that uh, both those topics might be relevant. Um, I uh, am going to start with a broad overview because I, I don't want this discussion to get too technical, but it is very technical. So I want to make sure that um, we're kind of on the same page and I'm not assuming too much as far as prior knowledge, background, area of interest. I mean, you could be really, really into reading and know a lot about it and not know a lot about the SLD rule and that's okay. So I'm gonna start uh, again um, at, at a pretty broad overview level. Um, I would love to be interrupted at any point. I actually have my chat box open. So um, anybody who wants to either raise their hand on the screen, there's not really that many of us. Um, uh, I, I'd be happy to be interrupted that way or, um, or by putting a question in the chat box. And uh, again, uh, this is not a formal presentation that has to go in a particular sequence. And I would much rather have it respond to uh, questions and topics or subtopics that are of interest to the people actually here. Because um, as I think you'll get a flavor of as I start talking about the SLD rule, it's enormously intricate. And I think the takeaway um, that I'm assuming is that people are, are interested in knowing how does the rule work right now? How, if it's revised the way it's proposed, will it change? And how are students, what are things that we can do so that students can be better served? Whether the rule as it is works or doesn't work or how it works or how it doesn't work. So with that, I will just get started. Okay, so I want to start because this, um, again, just to make sure we're on the same page as far as the knowledge base, but also because it's particularly important for a specific learning disability identification is to talk about the basics of how a student gets identified and qualified for special education. Although it's a simple process, uh, SLD kind of throws that process for a loop. Uh, and again, that um, I'm alluding to um, a lot of the problems and issues and concerns that I'll talk about in more detail. 
But basically, the special education eligibility process you can think about it pretty much in four steps. One is a referral. The referral, it can be made by a teacher or a parent or a daycare provider, uh, uh, children who have not entered um, kindergarten or who are pre-K um, can still be identified or still be referred as being suspected of having a disability to start the special education eligibility process started. And after a referral is made, the school district who receives the referral has the obligation to get the parent's consent to start an evaluation. And once that consent is received, then the district has 60 days from the date of consent, not the date of referral, the date of consent to, uh, to complete the student's evaluation and make a determination based on that evaluation as to whether the student is eligible or not for special education. So referral, step one, consent, step two, and that's the clock, that's when the clock starts ticking. The third step is the actual evaluation process. And that can entail lots of different things depending on the disability that is being uh, looked at. Uh, one thing I always want to remind people of is that the legal obligation is for student, a student who's been referred to be evaluated in all areas of suspected disability. And um, very often that does not happen, <laughs> but technically that, that's, that's the legal rule. It's, it is not simply um, this, per, this student has uh, a visual impairment and therefore we're only going to go through the checklist or only go through the in instruments that uh, address visual impairment. No, if there are other things going on that, uh, that could be suspected areas of disability, those need to be included in the evaluation as well. And then after the evaluation is done, there is a meeting of the IEP team to make a determination of eligibility. And that eligibility, again, depending on the category uh, of qualification or of the, the category or categories that evaluation's been performed in, there's gonna be a checklist and uh, the evaluation team will review the information obtained in the evaluation, other factors, see if it meets the criteria of applicable categories and determine whether the student's eligible and what categories of eligibility apply. So that, that's kind of the broad um, structure. One thing uh, I wanna mention, which is the kind of after all this, is that if the parents disagree with the results of the evaluation, the parents have the right under law to request an IEE, which stands for an independent educational evaluation, which is to have an evaluation done by someone outside the school at the school's expense. So an IEE is a right after the school's done the evaluation if the parents disagree with the evaluation. And that, that's, tuck that in your mind because um, I'll be mentioning something about that a little later. Okay, so the obligation to, for someone, but particularly someone in, say, a classroom with um, a student and sees them struggling, um, the legal obligation for them to raise a hand and say, hey, lifeguard, uh, perhaps you should be paying attention to that um, swimmer that looks like they might be drowning in the deep end. Um, that's the child find obligation or what's referred to as a child find obligation under, under federal law. And it's really important and it is poorly enforced, but it is uh, something that should always be kept in mind as an important 
legal obligation that uh, basically, again, I mean, I like to think of it as similar to a mandated reporter obligation, which is if you're in a position to know that there might be a disability involved with a student, uh, you do have the obligation, if you're in a position, uh, again, to do so, to raise your hand and initiate a referral. So let's talk about SLD, specific learning disability. Uh, there are 11 categories, different eligibility categories for special education. SLD is one of them, but it's different from the other 10 in a really significant way. Um, it's really the only eligibility uh, category that actually requires um, regular education-based interventions before what usually would happen in the IEP eligibility process for any other disability takes place. And the reason for that is that when the SLD rule was uh, overhauled again around 10 years ago, uh, Wisconsin has limited the basis on which a student can be found eligible, at, eligible for special education under SLD to where, where the student has an adequate classroom achievement. And then I'm gonna add three words here that make this, uh, that make this especially different from other disabilities. Inadequate classroom achievement after intensive in interventions. So it's not enough that uh, the student's taken a, a norm, a norm referenced uh, standardized assessment and is found to uh, score lower, you know, below, you know, one and a quarter standard deviations from the mean. It's inadequate classroom achievement after the student has undergone intensive interventions. So that's criterion number one. And the student must have failed to make adequate progress in at least two interventions. And those are, so by definition, these interventions are administered in, in the regular education classroom. So unlike special education uh, with other eligibility categories, where as soon as the referral comes in, um, someone who, whoever does the evaluation process, um, you know, kind of uh, gathers um, what the appropriate um, assessment instruments might be. And it's, it's already in, in what I'll call Spedland. It's already in a special education driven process because the referrals made, a decision is made uh, probably in the central office based central uh, special education function perhaps as to what assessments are gonna be used for the evaluation and then the uh, parent consent to those evaluations is obtained to start the 60 day clock ticking. For SLD, you don't get there <laughs> for a long time, which is one of the problems. So the existing, existing SLD rule requires at least two interventions. The revised SLD rule requires at least two and sometimes three, but I will go into that in more detail. Um, but I wanted to finish a little bit, uh, finish up on the rule. So there has to be an adequate achievement academically after intensive intervention. There has to have been an adequate process, uh, an adequate progress during the intervention uh, process. And those two things must not have been caused by. And then there is a long thing, a long list of things that will screen out students who might otherwise have had an adequate classroom achievement or inadequate progress. And that's inadequate instruction, screens you out, 
uh, the wrong type of achievement measurement because there are intricate rules as to what kind of instruments can or can't be used depending on some characteristics of the student. Uh, and student factors such as cultural, linguistic, or economic factors can also be used as a reason to um, essentially say, well, yes, there's an adequate classroom achievement. And yes, there was an adequate uh, response to an intensive intervention, but really that was because of other things and not a disability. So, so SLD, uh, basically all those things uh, kind of paint the picture of, of what's going on when we're talking about what the eligibility process is based on. So um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the actual revised rule. Um, I don't want to go into uh, dreadful specifics about it. I thought I would um, so what I've done is, and to, just to back up a bit, the process of DPI has been they put out a draft rule, uh, or not a draft rule, actually, a draft of possible revisions. That's not the term they use, but that's kind of the way it was presented. And uh, they said, uh, here's, here's something that... Um, we want to do a few focus groups on and collect a response to a survey. Um, and so uh, they did that. They had focus groups. I participated in one of them. Um, I missed the deadline for commenting on the survey and I do not regret having missed it because the draft rule as they've now officially submitted it to the clearinghouse uh, corrected two typos and made no other changes. So, um, so however, that being said, um, again, uh, Friday the 19th, is the official deadline for public comment on the official rule. And uh, regardless of uh, your, your degree of optimism as to whether comments will be entertained, um, I do think that at the um, official rule stage, comments actually do need to be responded to. And so I, um, I'm not exactly sure what comments I'm going to focus on submitting, but I will be submitting comments that will mostly relate to, hey, why didn't you take this opportunity to actually fix things that people told you <laughs> are problems? You <laughs> so anyway, um, okay. So uh, we have again, a question. Oh, oh. Yes. Yes. So will virtually learning, virtual learning be one of the things that will disqualify SLD eligibility? Uh, so uh, if the person who asked that question doesn't mind unmuting, I, I wanted, um, if you could unpack that a little more. Is, if, if, yeah. Yes. I was just asking that if they say, oh, we've been virtual learning, so you can't, um, we can't say that we've been able to provide all this instruction. And, you know, so it would be okay. there for saying, well, you would have um, an opportunity, they probably would have had an opportunity to do better if we hadn't had to virtual learn. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. this would become a disqualifying thing. Yes. Or I delaying yeah, eligibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, th that's a great question, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this in, in a very speculative manner. But um, I am going to um, think of uh, about this question as uh, uh, at the answer as an answer that a public school district would give. Okay, and if a public school district is saying actually is basically saying we haven't provided education. <laughs> and that is the reason why 
um, this student is not making appropriate progress. Um, I think that's that's a dangerous thing for them to do for a couple of reasons because they're they're not only saying it uh, they're basically um, if they're not giving back. Um, their IDEA funding, right. <laughs> which, is, right. which is which is actually the hammer that that is supposed to enforce these laws. Um, they they still have an obligation to deliver education. There is um, school uh, state education agencies, including Wisconsin's Wisconsin, have been uh, requesting relief due to COVID for standardized uh, assessments, for example. But those kinds of waivers from federal requirements have to be very specifically done. They also are subject to public notice and comment. Um, so, and I do know, and I apologize that I did not review you know, the latest and greatest uh, guidance that the U.S. Education Department has issued on this topic, because it obviously affects pretty much every um, every school, public school district um, that uh, that it has gone to hybrid or, or virtual learning. And um, I am going to guess without reading the guidance that uh, school districts are not being given a mulligan. Um, whether that means that parents who are encountering even greater delays in having the uh, SLD uh, identification process proceed have any real recourse, I wouldn't say that, but um, I think it would be very difficult for a school district to to legitimately, to be able to point to something in federal law or guidance that essentially uh, gives them a mulligan for, uh, basically what I think is, is that there'll be lots of tap dancing and it'll be, well, you know, hopefully nobody will call us on this, which is like, you know, pretty much how a lot of compliance issues end up, um, um, end up, uh, not getting resolved. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the SLD rule. So we know that inadequate academic achievement is one criterion. It appears first um, in the one and two uh, list in the SLD rule, but really that comment that's published elsewhere by DPI in response to um, either a Q&A or a comment uh, to the scope statement or, or something, the, the, the sequence of what happens is that is the, the RTI component, which is listed as number two um, of the two criteria, that actually has to happen first. Because you can do, because by definition, the inadequate classroom achievement after interventions, that can't be measured until the interventions have taken place. So I wanted to talk a little bit about interventions. And um, the, the definition of specific learning disability, I'm going to read that. Uh, it means, and I'm reading it from, uh, from the SLD rule, um, and it's not changing very much except for two really minor uh, kind of wording changes. So SLD, uh, it's a disorder in one or more of the basic psychological processes involved in understanding or using language, spoken or written, that may manifest itself in an imperfect is now being changed to the imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, or perform is being changed to do. Uh, mathematical calculations, including conditions such as perceptual disabilities, brain injury, minimal brain dysfunction, dyslexia, and so I just want to point out that dyslexia actually has been part of the list of words in the rule for a long time. Uh, and developmental aphasia. So that's the definition in the SLD rule. And except for those two like little minor wording changes, that's not changing in the revised rule. The re revised rule does not change. Um, what's more, 
helpful to know, I think for practical purposes, are the areas that actually get intervened in. And so that's a different list, okay? It's, uh, so if, um, if there is uh, an evaluation meeting that reviews the data collected and whether progress was made or not in interventions for a student who is being considered for uh, eligibility under SLD, the checklist from DPI contains eight areas. And I'll, I'll read those areas because they, um, I think kind of concretize what may actually be, what may actually happen or, or the specific decisions and instruments and assessments and interventions that, um, that a school may choose to employ um, uh, when an SLD um, uh, situation is presented. So the, the areas of intervention uh, are basic reading skill, reading comprehension, reading fluency skills, mathematics calculation, mathematics problem solving, written expression, oral expression, and listening comprehension. So that, that narrows down, I think, quite a bit um, or brings into focus more specifically than, again, the, the laundry list of things that um, are listed under SLD as to the specific, uh, I guess, areas in which uh, one would hope there are uh, appropriate uh, intervention methods that can provide valid and reliable measures of whether a student is or isn't making progress can be administered intensively um, and after they're administered have a basis on which uh, to determine that the student's academic achievement still is inadequate, notwithstanding having gone through those interventions. So the, there have been many occasions on which uh, concerned people like me, like parents, uh, like advocacy groups have brought to DPI's attention that the uh, SLD rule or the uh, evaluation process or the process just in general of getting a struggling reader help does not work. Um, and these aren't specific to Wisconsin, uh, but um, uh, so, uh, and when I say that, uh, uh, I mean that to say that uh, similar other states experience similar issues. I don't know what to what degree Wisconsin is worse, uh, but it's, you know, the, the big one is delays. Um, there is under federal law, the 60 day deadline that I referred to earlier between um, the time a parent gives consent for an evaluation until um, an eligibility determination must be made. But one of the exceptions that DPI has actually hard coded into its forms is an exception for SLD, uh, which is that um, there is a form that actually is, is part of their forms packet, uh, which is for parents to agree to extend the 60 day deadline uh, uh, if the evaluation, if the uh, eligibility category involved is SLD. So uh, I have no idea whether DPI tracks how many students uh, do, uh, are unable to be evaluated with their required number of interventions completed within the 60 day deadline. I think they, they have the obligation to do so, but um, it may be one of those things where, you know, um, if it's a problem we don't see, we don't have to deal with it. I, I think the, the feedback of parents 
uh, and others who pay close attention to this is that you know delays are a significant problem. Delays are a real problem. They are so much a problem that the United States Department of Education has very clear express written guidance that, um, that the response to intervention process should not, cannot uh, be used to delay identification. And yet we still have this issue. Um, so I see a comment in the chat box. Unfortunately, many too many children are being identified under OHI and then not given proper interventions for, for a struggling reader. Yes, that's a problem. Um, and that's a problem for a number of reasons. One is, again, the requirement is that students be identified in all areas of suspected disability. OHI, um, I know it's kind of used as a catch-all, but if you actually look at the eligibility criteria, criteria for OHI, it's, it's fairly specific. Um, and um, it, it's hard for me to figure out the reasoning of, say, if a student has dyslexia, how that gets shoehorned into OHI instead of the accurate category of SLD. Um, and then I also wanted to speak to the not given proper interventions for a struggling reader. Yes, that's true. Um, and I wanted to mention a little bit of a, a something that the law should do, that the law says and should be followed better, which is that theoretically in the fairy tale version of IDEA <laughs> that we would live under if, uh, if the law were followed with fidelity, it should not matter what your eligibility label is. If you have, if you are a student with, dis with a disability, and require specially designed instruction and maybe even related services on top of that, uh, your needs uh, on an individual basis are what need to be looked at regardless of the eligibility category that you entered the special education system in. Um, moreover, um, uh, the, a DPI, and I, I'm forgetting how many years ago, whether it's, it, it may have been, it may be five years from now, um, in an effort to uh, tell the feds that it's working on achievement gaps and poor reading achievement in particular, um, added to the IEP process for again, for student, uh, for uh, for districts that follow guidance and uh, and look at the forms and do what the forms uh, suggest they do, it is to actually look at reading issues for every student that has an IEP, not just those that have um, that uh, have an IEP under the SLD category. I certainly know anecdotally that that's not being followed. It's, it's a huge missed opportunity. And it's, it's one that um, could be a, a one way to, uh, to lessen the harm done by misclassification of a students who really should have been found eligible for SLD, but are again, um, kind of shoehorn shoehorned into OHI. So uh, that's a little bit of a digression, but um, I, I guess uh, one of the things that I always think about when looking at these issues is I want to know the practical impact. I mean, the only thing that matters to me is that a student who needs help gets help. Um, and especially if getting help is part of their civil right in a public education system, especially for which the school is receiving federal funding. So to me, that's a, that's, that should be a no brainer, but, the, but as we know, uh, things that ought to be often aren't. And so I'm interested in, in what are the practical ways of 
being able to, and it could be, you know, very often parents hack, have to hack the system, you know, um, develop a relationship that they know with someone that has greater pull uh, because they can't rely on people following the rules to get things done or responding or get things done in time. That's a hack. Another hack is uh, really to try to get more information about um, what's happening to students where schools may not be following the clear rules. The rules aren't perfect, and um, uh, I'll get into a little bit more of that later, but where, where the rules actually are there to protect students and they're not being followed, there needs to be a more accountability. And if there aren't systematic monitoring structures, then maybe that's something that parents and advocacy groups um, can get better organized about focusing on in a way that can bring it to the attention of um, funders at the federal government level who can point out, by the way, state education agency, one of your obligations when you get the great big, you know, whether it's the IDEA check or whether it's the Title I check or any other number of uh, federal funding um, uh, sources, uh, you tell us that you are taking on, you have taken on and you're follow, you follow through with your responsibility to ensure that your sub-grantees, your local school districts, your local educational agencies are following the law. And holding them to that is, is actually a good uh, tactic that I think should be explored more on a systemic level. I think it's more likely to be successful um, then, um, you know, showing up in focus groups, which I've done, and sending uh, suggestions um, and having them um, uh, basically completely disregarded. So uh, let me see, I'm looking into chat again. Can perspective on DPI's educational equity and how this can help students with SLD. Um, uh, I need a more specific um, pointer to educational equity. Uh, there are a lot, DPI has lots of programs um, that, <laughs> that refer to equity. Um, uh, there's one, um, so for example, there's one that has to do with, and this is under Title I, where there is a requirement that low-income students and, and um, students of color not get disproportionately served by, um, by underqualified teachers. And so um, when, uh, when the feds kind of did a review, um, they found that there were, I think, uh, at one time it was nine, maybe it's down to six, I don't know, but there, there were several districts that had that problem and they were called equity districts. So, um, so uh, I was not sure uh, if that is what you're referring to or let's see, uh, okay. Okay, I'm scrolling up, I see the bottom half of, okay. All right, so that, that's a definition of ed educational equity um, and, um, so DPI, I know, will probably sprinkle those words. Um, I learned a new term today, it's called copy pasta. <laughs> and, so, um, and so copy pasta is, uh, and it's, it's when um, someone will take something that sounds good and they'll kind of copy paste it into, um, you know, their latest press release or, you know, whatever, without actually doing anything. So, <laughs> um, so yes, I mean- Can I, I had a question. What states yes. have this sort of watchdog group you talk about, about, you know, whistleblowers for um, making sure uh, districts abide by IDA laws? Um, you know, North Carolina, <laughs> okay. North Carolina has a fabulous parents group 
that got their special education agency to investigate themselves. Oh. Themselves responsible for violating the child fine monitoring obligations that every state education agency that takes money from the federal government has. So that is, uh, um, and I don't know uh, what other um, states have similar things cooking along those lines. I think it is an obvious er uh, you know, area of opportunity. Um, and uh, I should also point out that North Carolina has a very similar, and this was specifically in the area of SLD. And their SLD rule is similar to Wisconsin's in that they are also uh, limited the eligibility criteria are limited to uh, response to intervention, uh, RTI, MTSS, MLSS um, uh, model. So North Carolina is definitely one to watch. That enforcement um, happened last year and the compliance piece is ongoing this year. So that, that's, uh, that's what I'm, I'm following um, pretty closely. So. Uh, I, I apologize for the detours, but I um, I actually would rather talk to people uh, talk about things that people are interested in, um, uh, uh, without you know getting too bogged down in um, the minutia because I, I have like notes that deal with a lot of minutia. But if if there are questions, please keep them coming. In the meantime, I am just going to go and. Um, the obvious, I think, question I'm guessing people may have is, so what's, what's different now? Um, what's proposed to be different with the, uh, oh, no, I will answer Lisa Hepburn's question. Is there any specificity in, SL, in the SLD rule about what constitutes an acceptable intervention? Okay, so there's good news and bad news. The revision to the SLD rule um, has a number of updates to definitions. Um, and um, there's one big one that I want to mention because it's something that initially threw me off until I kind of did some research. Um, and that is the difference between scientific research-based interventions or SRBIs and evidence-based interventions. And you know, depending on the Facebook group or groups you're in, or listservs that you're in, um, you know, probably a lot of us have seen the discussions of you know, there's you know, what's you know, research based versus evidence based versus SRBIs or scientific. Okay, the reason and and what the revised rule does is it deletes the term scientific research based intervention everywhere it used to appear. And now it, um, so in the existing rule, there's a reference to scientific research-based intervention or evidence-based intervention. SRBI is gone. So no need for tinfoil hats. There is a logical reason for this. The reason is ESSA, the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, and that is the, the easiest way to think of ESSA. It's really important, but uh, I will not go down that rabbit hole. The easiest to think, think about is that's where your Title I money comes from, okay? So ESSA was substantially revamped when it was reauthorized. Um, the, so ESSA is the current name for what used to be called no Child Left Behind, which is the, the original, original name of this law is the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. And when ESSA uh, revamped ESEA in uh, 2015, uh, the term scientific research base, which is a term of art, it, it has something with very specific meaning under the federal statute and regs, was changed to evidence-based. And um, evidence-based evidence asterisks 
the asterisks being that there are three levels of evidence base. Um, and I'm not going to go into gory detail, um, but basically there are three categories of evidence base, strong, moderate, or, or promising, I think are the, are the three levels of evidence base. And um, the revised rule does make reference to using um, interventions with the strongest evidence base. Um, but what the rule doesn't do, in, and um, in, in all, I guess, good faith, it really can't do, given the local control structure of uh, districts' um, uh, a purview of, of decision-making, is it doesn't tell you what those interventions, what acceptable interventions are. That's not to say that there can't be or shouldn't be uh, guidance. You know, maybe it's not a rule. Maybe it's not a, you know, you must, you know, use this specific instrument. But certainly there, it would be helpful. And frankly, it would be uh, more efficient um, if the, uh, if at a central level there were guidance, uh, particularly, you know, Again, we've got these, these specific um, areas of intervention that are identified. So we know that for each of these, uh, there better be an evidence-based intervention, and it would be helpful for um, there to be a resource guidance, technical assistance identifying what interventions are available, um, what uh, tier, I guess you could say, of um, you know, strong, um, uh, strong, moderate, moderate or promising, it fall, they fall under. Um, and there's some wrinkles too, you know, there, there are some evidence-based interventions that, sh that perhaps shouldn't be used if they're not um, uh, uh, culturally appropriate, things like that. Um, it, it is inefficient for uh, each individual district to basically figure this out on their own. And um, that inefficiency means that it won't happen. I think the great danger, um, because as I reread the SLD rule, um, because some of so much of it actually has not changed, um, thinking, well, you know, there there are a lot there are a lot of things in here that actually are are helpful in terms of the process. Um, there, uh, in terms of requiring the um, individual team members to have to. Uh, basically say what they individual that they individually sign on to the conclusions of the evaluation or if they disagree um, adding a description as to what you know stuff like that is very helpful and at the same time I wonder well does this really happen if you actually took an evaluation report of an IEP team how closely would it actually match um, how, how closely would it actually match um, what the rule, which again will have the effect of law, what the rule requires them to do. So um, I wanted to, I, I think I had started talking about uh, problems that people um, have experienced delays, use of exclusionary criteria, uh, where some, uh, where an IEP team may decide, well, um, the reason this student is not able to make progress in intensive interventions nor achieve adequately is really because of cultural or economic or linguistic factors. So that is just put out there that originates from federal law. Um, however, there is no guidance whatsoever um, as to how um, a valid determination of um, those factors, factors like that being the primary reason of the underachievement as opposed to the a disability. In the absence of guidance, I can certainly tell you that is uh, that leaves it wide open 
to, um, I think, misuse if there is a conflict of interest, <laughs> um, if it's better for the uh, for whoever's making the determination that the student not be um, not be identified, and whether that's because they're worried about their numbers and they've been tagged for over the school or the district's been tagged for over identifying students of color. Um, this is another one of these problems where um, people like me would not be inclined to um, think um, uh, potentially negative things about the motivations of how this could go wrong if there were greater transparency about how many students are excluded or screened out from being found eligible for special education and the services they need because an IEP team decided that the underperformance and the inability to progress was primarily due to a cultural factor. I don't even know what a cultural factor is. Um, so, so that is, um, I, I think that's a big issue. It's hard to grapple with it again in the absence of data and being able to point to, this is why I think it's a problem. I think it's a problem simply because it sets up a dynamic and motivations that are harmful to a student who needs help and doesn't have the power to enforce the process and to engage the protection of the laws. Okay, let's see, what other problems? Okay, remember though that new acronym, IEE, Independent Educational Evaluations. If the only way a student can get identified for needing special education by reason of a specific learning disability is for there to be interventions performed in uh, the classroom at their school and for observations to be made at their school. Um, and uh, then how does a parent who disagrees with the evaluation uh, how do they go out and enforce their right to get an independent educational evaluation? So two things about an IEE. One is obviously it's good that there's the uh, element of it being paid for by the school. So it's good that if for a parent not to have to pay for it itself. But, but the, I think probably the more important thing is that the ability to get a second opinion. Um, and a question that um, I've raised uh, probably ever since, you know, I've focused on the SLD rule, which again is 10 years ago almost, um, and have never really gotten an answer to is what happens to parents, IEE, rights to get an independent educational evaluation for if they disagree with a specific learning disability evaluation process that the schools conducted. So that, that's a big question. Um, I, um, I, I, again, another one of those things where it would be more helpful to have transparency in information about um, how many parents are denied eligibility um, have outside sources that, uh, that provide other types, alternative evidence of specific learning disability, and then are told, no, that's not, that's inadequate for purposes of meeting the requirements of the rule. I don't know how often it happens. It's important to know how often that happens. It's important to know, um, if in fact the IEE right is, is non-existent um, for specific learning disability because of the unique uh, manner in which eligibility is determined for that one eligibility category. 
Okay, so I, oh, okay. So we allotted one hour for this. I, I can tell you that I am happy to go as long as anybody's interested in, but let me just quickly in the four minutes uh, remaining till four o'clock, let me just go quickly through the substantive changes that um, I, uh, I see between the existing rule and the proposed revised rule. Uh, we already talked about one, there's no, no more SRBIs. Um, the revised rule eliminates the requirement that the baseline for progress monitoring, monitoring be the median of three pro, uh, probes, and it provides more flexibility uh, so that um, again, with, um, with the eight different categories where you could have very different uh, intervention instruments, um, having that replaced with a requirement um, that the, um, that the uh, monitoring um, be matched to the student and, um, and also uh, while yet still providing the information and the ability for the team to create a baseline that um, that closer that aligns more closely with what actually is being monitored and assessed. Um, I'm not sure that's a bad thing. You know, um, I'm I'm you know happy to be open to others who know more about this stuff. But um, having the flexibility to gain more information um, and certainly to uh, potentially um, speed up the process for completing evaluations is really is really important. Um, let's see, uh, there's some changes to people who need to be part of the evaluation team. Uh, a licensed SLP speech language pathologist must be on the team. If oral expression or uh, listening comprehension were, uh, uh, were the issues, if the student is an English learner, a person knowledgeable in ESL, and um, that's I'm plain languaging that a little bit, but I note that it's not a license, license requirement, unlike the SLP. The SLP has to be licensed. For ESL, it's a person knowledgeable in ESL it needs to needs to be involved in observations and also as a member of the team. Um, there used to be a prompt when a reevaluation of a student with uh, SLD occurred, a prompt to actually disqualify them from eligibility. Um, and that prompt no longer, that prompt has been removed, although technically speaking, uh, presumably that, that could happen at an evaluation at any rate. Okay, here's a question from John Humphreys. What do you think about making 504 referrals for dyslexia and suggesting that the accommodations are scientifically based instructional strategies? Well, um, uh, I would say as long as the parent is not confused about what, an, uh, what a 504 is and isn't. Um, a 504, um, so I guess thinking of what a special education, um, especially what specially designed instruction, which is what um, a struggling reader might need um, and gets both baked into um, an individualized education program and the effectiveness of that service being evaluated at a minimum every year, um, you know, I'm not sure how, um, how robust those safeguards are for 504s. So, um, but I guess if parents can understand that you can have a 504 and an IEP, I think sometimes people treat them as either or, and actually that's not true. Um, so I, I'm not sure there is a downside to going that route. I would, to the extent that uh, parents uh, are interested in pursuing eligibility under IDEA, I, I strongly encourage them, uh, you know, I think that that's a good idea. 
uh, simply because the ability to um, enforce at least some aspects of the process is much greater under IDEA and there's much more accountability under IDEA because of the funding um, than there is under 504. And um, again, I am not so sure that that specially designed instruction is an accommodation. If you can get someone to, um, to um, in a school to deliver a service, which actually is, you know, specially designed instruction and call an accommodation and agree to do that. Well, obviously that that's a good thing. The question is, um, is, is that, is that ideal or is, um, is that something that should be a stopgap um, uh, until um, uh, uh, while the parent pursues getting it done the right way. You know, I, um, I'm all in favor of practical approaches. I do think that uh, for an informed decision about that, again, parents and, and per perhaps even school personnel should understand um, the nuances of 504, um, because uh, I, I think 504 is frequently misunderstood and it, and it does not have kind of the built-in procedural protections that, again, however, um, in, in the real world, um, not as helpful as they could be, they are, they are still more than you um, get under, under 504. Okay, yes, okay, so this is, this is where I'm scrolling down the, uh, the chat box and it goes all the way up to the top. <laughs> it's like reaching the bottom. I am sorry, let's see. Okay, yeah, the IEE issues are huge. IEs can be quite expensive, but districts place dollar amount caps. Mm. Um, yeah, a questionable practice. Um, yes, also how independent are IEs because schools? Yes, okay. Well, there's a long history of IEE mischief in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. I do have to say. Um, uh, the, so um, it, it used to be back in the day that um, that districts were allowed to actually kind of blackball, or, you know, or, or not allow the list of evaluators, evaluators who were in private schools or had been maybe adverse at experts or testified as experts in, in an adverse proceeding. And so there, there is a, there's written, or, or there's a, there's something called letter to Petska and Petska was one of the special education directors, uh, DPI, um, a few directors back saying, you can't do that. <laughs> so that's, that's the letter that everyone nationwide refers to when their school district tries to tell them, oh, you can't use that evaluator because they testified against us in a, a due process hearing. Okay, let me look at these new messages. Okay. There's one here. Um, sometimes it feels that schools don't want to identify SLD in reading because there are so many students who are not reading at grade level. That is so true. That is if so tier, true. Yeah, if tier one reading instruction improves in Wisconsin, do you think SLD might start working for parents of kids who actually have a reading disability as opposed to the kids who just never received appropriate tier one instruction? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, so one of the things I, I really wanted to say is it's strange to, you know, at this, this point I have poured over the, the rule in, in, in its previous current incarnation and its current incarnation and compare, compare them word by word many, 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 many times. And it's so interesting not to see the term MTSS or tier one, two, three um, discussed um, and leaving, uh, leaving the whole process and the, the gut of the process has ha actually happens before special education gets involved, right? Um, and it's this great big nebulous black box. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so parents aren't being told that um, they're, 
uh, their child is in some tier of intervention. Right. Um, how long they've been in there, how well they've done, how well they haven't done. Um, that's not being regulated. And that I think is an omission that should have been front and center in my view of, um, of revamping this rule. Um, because uh, again, without, without those guardrails, there's no guidance and um, is there anything that regs that requires schools to tell parents, not to my knowledge, I have not seen that. I've not seen that. I think that that kind of falls under um, local control. I think once the special ed evaluation process is officially triggered by a referral, then there are all bunch of notice requirements that essentially get imported in because of federal law. But what I get concerned about is how much happens and how long it takes before it gets to that point. And I think that's extremely damaging in the SLD context because those are requirements. You don't, you know, um, you don't get to uh, even get the process started until the regular education based Interve intensive intervention, and at least two of them have been completed. Um, and um, so um, speaking to, I guess, practical solutions is that when guidance is developed, and I assume guidance will be developed, at a minimum, the forms are gonna be updated, right, uh, for the new rule then that will be a time to see what they do and just continue to raise these problems. Another thing I, I would wanted to bring, although this also falls into the category of, you know, kind of talking into a tin can um, without a string <laughs> attached to another tin can is that the uh, Superintendent's Council on Special Education um, uh, has uh, invites public comment a couple times a year. And one of those public comment periods is coming up, I think March 1. Um, and that would be uh, a, an opportunity to say, um, these are issues that have, uh, that are persisting and um, do not appear that they're, they're gonna be addressed uh, sufficiently in the revision to the SLD rule. Uh, it's really your responsibility, special education team and DPI, to be aware of this uh, uh, due to your child fine responsibility and your supervisory uh, responsibility as a state educational authority to make sure that local education agencies are complying with federal law. So laying the groundwork for um, uh, for future uh, more systemic uh, advocacy is, is always a good idea. You never know, um, you know when the right opportunity is. And again, um, you know, uh, there are a lot of time, there's a lot of time that people do spend um, writing and sending comments. I, I do a lot of that and it's disappointing when they're not acknowledged or adopted, but still it's important to make points so that at a minimum you can go back and say, look, you've known about this for a long time and it's not getting better. And you do actually have the responsibility um, within the purview of what your agency is supposed to be doing and what you tell the federal government that you're doing to address these issues. And by the way, um, this has a direct relationship to why your students with disabilities are not, are actually falling behind the targets that you have set for closing the achievement gap. They're, they're not, it's not even that their rate of progress is slower than your, oh, they're, they're regressing. Um, and so, yes, there is a connection. There's a clear connection. And one way to really get at the heart of helping students, helping parents, and in the process, helping you do your job, state education agency and local education agencies, 
is to um, understand this feedback and use it to, uh, to improve um, how you meet the needs of students who are struggling. Okay, so how do we, oh, okay. So I, I'm sorry, I fell behind on chat because I was yammering. I that was me, Chan. So how do we, how do we get knowledge of these meetings and how do we, you know, we have various parent groups in the state and watchdog groups and so on and so forth, but it's fallen on deaf ears so often. Although I do have to say our momentum is picking up but mm -hmm. I mean, just the fact that we have what we have, we had 16 people on this call today and that's, that's good, you know, so there is, yes. right? So I yes. think the word's getting out. Um, I think social media has been very effective for that. And I would love to have this group grow and we, so we can get, you know, start putting bugs in people's ears and start, you know, raising hell and trying, you know, this is enough, enough is enough for our kids. Yeah. Um, so I have I have a suggestion. One is that I'm allergic to Facebook, but given that things are a little quieter now, I may start going back on it more regularly. And I would be as I see things, you know, um, you know, opportunities to comment, whatnot. I, I will be happy to share. Um, what I come across, you know, I won't, I won't pretend that I'm, you know, plugged into everything, but, you know, certainly I can forward the information um, about the, um, um, the state, stu the superintendent council on special education. Um, public exactly. You know, things like that. Yep. Yep. It's and also, great. Um, I am going to follow what's happening in North Carolina really closely. I know the parent who um, is uh, who spearheaded that, and um, uh, I, I can suggest maybe a topic for a future discussion might be what they did in North Carolina, because there are so many parallels in terms of how their rule is structured and the problems that they were able to identify and actually get taken seriously. Um, so that that uh, might be an interesting topic um, for seeing uh, how it's actually being done elsewhere. I'm highly interested in that. Okay, so since reading by, yes, 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 yes. Uh, I agree with Kathy Klein's comment so much. We should advocate for all students not at that level to be automatically identified with SLD and reading. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I think the thing of, of all the things that that um, made me react was was the, the little thing um, or what seemed like a little thing, but not a little thing, which is, you know, the first criterion for SLD, which is inadequate uh, classroom achievement after intensive intervention. It's like, oh, this is a whole problem. So, um, but that, you know, that that's part of the existing rule. That's not changing with the revised rule. Um, and so understanding the specifics of what your particular school district is doing with respect to whether they call it RTI, MTSS, MLSS, um, uh, there, there's, there's even another acronym that I've, I've heard. Well, we all know what it is. Okay. Um, if nobody knows, and particularly the parents who need to know, mm -hmm. if there's no easy way to find out, um, what the school or school district system is for implementing RTI, um, for which uh, interventions are used, with what information or data is given to the parents as it's happening, with how long the student is at each tier. Um, if that information is not readily available, that's a problem because actually to me, that's a, that's a sign. It's, it's not a sign that everybody who's not a parent 
um, and is in central office, has this information or, and is hoarding it. No, I think it's more likely that um, it's, it's, there's no system. <laughs> there's no system. It's it's ad hoc. It's um, you know. Well, this is what we always do, and maybe it's different in this building, and maybe it's different in that building, um, and that that doesn't serve any well uh, anybody well either. I, I can't imagine that that would make make people who work with students and want to uh, see them succeed that 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 would make them uh, feel better about um, you know. Uh, how they do their jobs. So, so um, again, the rule, there's still lots to say about the rule. I'll try to forward a couple of comments before the comment deadline this time. Um, but I think where the rubber meets the road is going to be whatever guidance that DPI puts out um, connected to this revision. And particularly what implementation looks like at the building level and the classroom level. Um, because um, um, again, um, it, it, it could simply be that the people who are in the positions of having to make decisions or make things happen may not know, may not understand kind of the full scope of you know, what happens and what ought to happen and what the law requires because it, it's never been uh, monitored and enforced, and um, uh, there hasn't been technical assistance sought. Um, and when uh, a parent has a child who is stuck, then uh, there's no place for the parent to go if they've been sending email and email and email and get no response. And you know that that's unfortunately standard operating procedure. That parents, so many parents have experienced that um, it it's kind of a good explanation of why um, RTI, although you know there's great there was great hope for it and that, that great great hope continues in the fact that it is still the sole uh, basis for finding um, a student eligible to SLD. Um, not recognizing that um, it, it doesn't reflect the reality of what um, what can be accomplished, uh, that's um, that's that's a problem. So I just typed in to the chat, and I think you know this will maybe be the closing here. Um, DPI has finally come out with that um, foundational reading skills tool, the first it's called, mm -hmm. and. Um, even though there's some inconsistencies in it and some inaccurate information, um, it is it is the the first thing that it's the first attempt that DPI has given us on um, guidance on what to do. Even though they don't come out and say exactly what to do, but they do give more guidance than we've ever had in the past. Um, and I think. Um, I'm hoping that through this forum, we can get more of that information out to teachers. Um, just to let everyone know, we're planning an April uh, event, and we're going to have various people from various CESAs and um, talking about opportunities in Wisconsin that can promote evidence-based instruction. So, you know, that's April 24th. Mark your calendars. It's a half day. Um, and we're just hoping to get the word out. Uh, I really would like to spend some time talking about this first tool. Um, again, it's a time issue. I don't have a whole lot of time to piece through that, but I'm hoping that others can step up and, and do that and we can, we can go through it. There's six sections to it and maybe we could break it down into sections. I really think this would be a valuable tool for, you know, your, for people like yourselves who are here to disseminate that information to others, uh, whether it's in your CISA or your schools, uh, it needs to happen. Um, I don't see DPI going out of their way, knocking down doors saying, hey, this is really cool. This is great. We, this is going to get us on the road that we need to be. No, it's one of those things. As you all know, DPI comes out with all these initiatives and they go nowhere fast. So <laughs> I'm hoping this one works. Anyway, um, 
Yeah, and Amy McGovern is um, is working that also, as is CESA 8. So we have two CESAs in the state of Wisconsin that are on top of things, CESA 8 and CESA 9. So the northern part of the state is a little more covered than the southern part. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't happen. So um, as you know, you know, there's the Reading League, we have IDA, we have Decoding Dyslexia, Wisconsin Reading Coalition. Um, I just started, I'm, I was just a, I volunteered to be president of the Literacy Task Force of Northern Wisconsin. We're changing our name to Literacy Task Force of Wisconsin. So, you know, there's various organizations out there who are really trying to um, make that awareness because it's really all what it's about, it's awareness. And getting, um, Another issue is getting our Wisconsin State Reading Association teachers um, informed because they're, they have not been informed about what instruction, good instruction need is. Um, they, that information has been kept from them for 20 plus years. So we're gonna really try to inf infiltrate <laughs> the membership <laughs> and, um, and get, get the information they need to be effective teachers, more effective teachers for our kids. So, Jan, thank you so much for thank everything. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> does anyone ever have any closing comments or questions? Um, I think Chan said she'd stay on if you do. Um, you know, please keep your eyes on the Wisconsin Science of Reading, What I Should Have Learned in College site because that's where everything's going to be posted okay or reading league either one so all right thanks everybody thank you bye <laughs> bye bye stick around in case somebody has questions actually i do have a quick question yes um so so getting back to those ratings um promising moderate and strong mm -hmm. now so twofold question are those ratings of interventions or like any kind of material let me find it, it's actually very clearly defined in the revised rule so let me let okay. me find where it's um and that definition actually comes straight out of essa Okay. okay. Oh. So, okay. So this is um, okay. So these definitions, for purposes of the rule, um, are for interventions as opposed to just you know programs in general. Um, so strong evidence of a strong evidence means strong evidence from at least one well-designed and well-implemented experimental study. Moderate evidence is moderate evidence from at least one well-designed and well-implemented quasi-experimental study. <laughs> and promising evidence is promising evidence from at least one well-designed and well-implemented correlational study <laughs> with statistical controls for selection bias. So I think it will be, I think that's why it's important for the DPI to say, here's a list of what we think yeah, are yeah. the interventions that fall into which category for each of these eight areas mm -hmm. um, under SLD. Because how are school districts going to decide, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. how, how are parents going to be able to, because the requirement is that the intervention for the, the intensive intervention requirement is for the intervention to be at the strongest level, not the strongest um, in, in terms of strong evidence, but basically the highest level of, um, um, of evidence available. So it could be that if you're doing an intervention for mathematics problem solving, that there's only, you know, um, the evidence base is only, is only moderate instead of strong. But still, you know, having a list of which falls under which um, is something that should be done, it should be a central resource, I would think. Okay.
I, yeah, I mean, I just, I noticed that th there's, there's a tool that we're using that I never considered an intervention and that's mm. Lexia. Like Lexia has been rated. Lexia has a rating of something by ESSA. I'm sure of it, but mm -hmm. I, I would never have considered Lexia mm. an intervention. I, yeah. you know, I thought it was like a supplementary. Yeah, yeah. Structured it, could, it could be that right? the ESSA definition is broader. Okay. And that they okay. used, that that's been imported for this particular context. I, I did not go back to ESSA to, to look at the full context, but that's highly possible because actually I saw the same thing. I, there was, I think Baltimore City Schools have adopted a new reading program that looks terrible <laughs> because it looks very <sighs> whole language balance literacy, but um, it cleared some, you know, bar, and I don't know whether it was under this or under what works clearinghouse tied to ESSA, but it's like, you know, you gotta, you gotta do your own consumer reports almost, you know? Definitely. You know All that right. for sure, Lisa, right? Yeah. <laughs> that is for sure. All right, Chan, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for coming. Yeah, absolutely. And enjoy your day Bye. all right friend nice job everyone thank you thank you thanks again keep in touch chan okay absolutely all right okay bye-bye have a good day you too